Lesson 5 Resurrections Before the Cross Sabbath Afternoon October 22 Abraham's unquestioning obedience was one of the most striking instances of faith and reliance upon God to be found in the sacred record. With only the naked promise that his descendants should possess Canaan, without the least outward evidence, he followed on where God should lead, fully and sincerely complying with the conditions on his part, and confident that the Lord would faithfully perform his word. The patriarch went wherever God indicated his duty. He passed through wildernesses without terror. He went among idolatrous nations with the one thought, God has spoken. I am obeying his voice. He will guide. He will protect me. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 4, page 524. Only he who alone hath immortality dwelling in light and life could say, I have power to lay it, my life, down, and I have power to take it again. John chapter 10, verse 18. Selected Messages, Book 1, page 301. To talk of religion in a casual way, to pray without soul hunger and living faith, avails nothing. A nominal faith in Christ which accepts Him merely as the Savior of the world can never bring healing to the soul. The faith that is unto salvation is not a mere intellectual assent to the truth. He who waits for entire knowledge before he will exercise faith cannot receive blessing from God. It is not enough to believe about Christ. We must believe in Him. The only faith that will benefit us is that which embraces Him as a personal Savior, which appropriates His merits to ourselves. Many hold faith as an opinion. Saving faith is a transaction by which those who receive Christ join themselves in covenant relation with God. Genuine faith is life. A living faith means an increase of vigor, a confiding trust by which the soul becomes a conquering power. Our confession of His faithfulness is heaven's chosen agency for revealing Christ to the world. We are to acknowledge His grace as made known through the holy men of old. But that which will be most effectual is the testimony of our own experience. We are witnesses for God as we reveal in ourselves the working of a power that is divine. Every individual has a life distinct from all others and an experience differing essentially from theirs. God desires that our praise shall ascend to Him, marked by our own individuality. These precious acknowledgments to the praise of the glory of His grace, when supported by a Christ-like life, have an irresistible power that works for the salvation of souls. The Desire of Ages, page 347. Sunday, October 23. The Resurrection of Moses A wilderness grave was the goal of Moses' years of toil and heart-burdening care. But he who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think, Ephesians chapter 3 verse 20, had in this measure answered his servant's prayer. Moses passed under the dominion of death, but he was not to remain in the tomb. Christ himself called him forth to life. Satan, the tempter, had claimed the body of Moses because of his sin, but Christ, the Savior, brought him forth from the grave. Jude, verse 9. Moses, upon the Mount of Transfiguration, was a witness to Christ's victory over sin and death. He represented those who shall come forth from the grave at the resurrection of the just. Elijah, who had been translated to heaven without seeing death, represented those who will be living upon the earth at Christ's second coming and who will be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trump, when this mortal must put on immortality and this corruptible must put on incorruption. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verses 51 to 53. The Desire of Ages, page 421. 
The Father chose Moses and Elijah to be his messengers to Christ and glorify him with the light of heaven and commune with him concerning his coming agony because they had lived upon earth as men. They had experienced human sorrow and suffering and could sympathize with the trial of Jesus in his earthly life. Elijah, in his position as a prophet to Israel, had represented Christ, and his work had been, in a degree, similar to that of the Savior. And Moses, as the leader of Israel, had stood in the place of Christ, communing with him and following his directions. Therefore these two, of all the hosts that gathered around the throne of God, were fittest to minister to the Son of God. Ellen G. White comments in the SDA Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1096. Christ came to this world for no other purpose than to manifest the glory of God, that man might be uplifted by its restoring power. All power and grace were given to him. His heart was a wellspring of living water, a never-failing fountain ever ready to flow forth in a rich, clear stream to those around him. His whole life was spent in pure, disinterested benevolence. His purposes were full of love and sympathy. He rejoiced that he could do more for his followers than they could ask or think. His constant prayer for them was that they might be sanctified through the truth, and he prayed with assurance, knowing that an almighty decree had been given before the world was made. He knew that the gospel of the kingdom would be preached in all the world. That truth, armed with the omnipotence of the Holy Spirit, would conquer in the contest with evil, and that the blood-stained banner would one day wave triumphantly over his followers. That I May Know Him, page 37. Monday October 24. Two Old Testament Cases In this poverty-stricken home, the famine pressed sore, and the pitifully meager fare seemed about to fail. The coming of Elijah on the very day when the widow feared that she must give up the struggle to sustain life tested to the utmost her faith in the power of the living God to provide for her necessities. But even in her dire extremity, she bore witness to her faith by a compliance with the request of the stranger who was asking her to share her last morsel with him. The widow of Zarephath shared her morsel with Elijah, and in return, her life and that of her son were preserved. And to all who, in time of trial and want, give sympathy and assistance to others more needy, God has promised great blessing. Conflict and Courage, page 206. The mother would not be satisfied till Elisha himself came with her. As the Lord liveth, and as thy soul liveth, I will not leave thee, she declared. And he arose and followed her. When they reached the house, Elisha went into the room where the dead child lay and shut the door upon them twain, and prayed unto the Lord. And he went up, and lay upon the child, and put his mouth upon his mouth, and his eyes upon his eyes, and his hands upon his hands. And he stretched himself upon the child, and the flesh of the child waxed warm. Then he returned, and walked in the house to and fro, and went up, and stretched himself upon him, and the child sneezed seven times, and the child opened his eyes. So was the faith of this woman rewarded. Christ, the great life-giver, restored her son to her. In like manner will his faithful ones be rewarded, when, at his coming, death loses its sting, and the grave is robbed of the victory it has claimed. Then will he restore to his servants the children that have been taken from them by death. Thus saith the Lord, A voice was heard in Ramah, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel, weeping for her children, refused to be comforted for her children because they were not. Thus saith the Lord, Refrain thy voice from weeping and thine eyes from tears, for thy work shall be rewarded and they shall come again from the land of the enemy, 
And there is hope in thine end, saith the Lord, that thy children shall come again to their own border. Jeremiah chapter 31 verses 15 to 17. Prophets and Kings, pages 238 and 239. Tuesday, October 25, the son of the widow of nine. Your compassionate Redeemer is watching you with love and sympathy, ready to hear your prayers and to render you the assistance which you need. He knows the burdens of every mother's heart and is her best friend in every emergency. His everlasting arms support the God-fearing faithful mother. When upon earth, he had a mother that struggled with poverty, having many anxious cares and perplexities, and he sympathizes with every Christian mother in her cares and anxieties. That Savior who took a long journey for the purpose of relieving the anxious heart of a woman whose daughter was possessed by an evil spirit will hear the mother's prayers and will bless her children. He who gave back to the widow her only son as he was carried to the burial is touched today by the woe of the bereaved mother. He is woman's best friend today and is ready to aid her in all the relations of life. The Adventist Home, page 204. He who stood beside the sorrowing mother at the gate of nine watches with every morning one beside the bier. He is touched with sympathy for our grief. His heart, that loved and pitied, is a heart of unchangeable tenderness. His word, that called the dead to life, is no less efficacious now than when spoken to the young man of nine. He says, All power is given unto me in heaven and in earth. Matthew chapter 28, verse 18. That power is not diminished by the lapse of years, nor exhausted by the ceaseless activity of His overflowing grace. To all who believe on Him, He is still a living Savior. The Desire of Ages, page 319. When our noble Henry died at the age of 16, when our sweet singer was born to the grave and we no more heard his early song, ours was a lonely home. Both parents and the two remaining sons felt the blow most keenly. But God comforted us in our bereavements and with faith and courage we pressed forward in the work he had given us in bright hope of meeting our children who had been torn from us by death in that world where sickness and death will never come. Life Sketches, page 165 We should anticipate the sorrows, the difficulties, the troubles of others. We should enter into the joys and cares of both high and low, rich and poor. Freely ye have received, Christ says, freely give. Matthew chapter 10, verse 8 all around us are poor, tried souls that need sympathizing words and helpful deeds. There are widows who need sympathy and assistance. There are orphans whom Christ has bidden his followers receive as a trust from God. Too often these are passed by with neglect. They may be ragged, uncouth, and seemingly in every way unattractive. Yet they are God's property. They have been bought with a price, and they are as precious in His sight as we are. They are members of God's great household, and Christians, as His stewards, are responsible for them. Christ's Object Lessons, page 386 Wednesday, October 26 Jairus's daughter. While they were still on the way, a messenger pressed through the crowd, bearing to Jairus the news that his daughter was dead, and it was useless to trouble the master further. The word caught the ear of Jesus. Fear not, he said, believe only, and she shall be made whole. Jairus pressed closer to the Savior, and together they hurried to the ruler's home. 
Already the hired mourners and flute players were there, filling the air with their clamor. The presence of the crowd and the tumult jarred upon the spirit of Jesus. He tried to silence them, saying, Why make ye this ado and weep? The damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. They were indignant at the words of the stranger. They had seen the child in the embrace of death, and they laughed him to scorn. Jesus approached the bedside and, taking the child's hand in his own, he pronounced softly in the familiar language of her home the words, Damsel, I say unto thee, Arise. Instantly a tremor passed through the unconscious form. The pulses of life beat again. The lips unclosed with a smile. The eyes opened widely as if from sleep, and the maiden gazed with wonder on the group beside her. She arose, and her parents clasped her in their arms and wept for joy. The Desire of Ages, pages 342 and 343. It is the privilege of Christians to know indeed that Christ is in them of a truth. This is the victory that overcometh the world, even our faith. All things are possible to him that believeth, and whatsoever things we desire when we pray, if we believe that we receive them, we shall have them. This faith will penetrate the darkest cloud and bring rays of light and hope to the drooping, desponding soul. It is the absence of this faith and trust which brings perplexity, distressing fears, and surmisings of evil. God will do great things for His people when they put their entire trust in Him. Godliness with contentment is great gain. Pure and undefiled religion will be exemplified in the life. Christ will prove a never-failing source of strength, a present help in every time of trouble. Testimonies for the Church, Volume 2, page 139. God's voice is heard. I have loved thee with an everlasting love. Jeremiah chapter 31, verse 3. With everlasting kindness will I have mercy on thee. Isaiah chapter 54, verse 8. How amazing is this love that God condescends to remove all cause for doubt and questioning from human fears and weakness and takes hold of the trembling hand reached up to him in faith, and he helps us to trust him by multiplied assurances and securities. What more could our Lord do to strengthen our faith in his promises? That I may know him, page 262. Thursday, October 27. Lazarus. Christ had not only the loved ones at Bethany to think of, he had the training of his disciples to consider. They were to be his representatives to the world that the Father's blessing might include all. For their sake, he permitted Lazarus to die. Had he restored him from illness to health, the miracle that is the most positive evidence of his divine character would not have been performed. Had Christ been in the sick room, Lazarus would not have died, for Satan would have had no power over him. In the presence of the life-giver, death could not have aimed his dart at Lazarus. He permitted Lazarus to pass under the dominion of death, and the suffering sisters saw their brother laid in the grave. Christ knew that as they looked on the face of their dead brother, their faith in their Redeemer would be severely tried. Thus he was pruning the branches that they might bring forth more fruit. He knew that because of the struggle through which they were now passing, their faith would shine forth with far greater power. Sons and Daughters of God, page 92 Take ye away the stone, Christ said. Thinking that he only wished to look upon the dead, Martha objected, saying that the body had been buried four days and corruption had already begun its work. This statement, made before the raising of Lazarus, left no room for Christ's enemies to say that a deception had been practiced. In the past, the Pharisees had circulated false statements regarding the most wonderful manifestations of the power of God. When Christ raised to life the daughter of Jairus, he had said, the damsel is not dead, but sleepeth. Mark chapter 5, verse 39. 
As she had been sick only a short time and was raised immediately after death, the Pharisees declared that the child had not been dead, that Christ himself had said she was only asleep. They had tried to make it appear that Christ could not cure disease, that there was foul play about his miracles. But in this case, none could deny that Lazarus was dead. The Desire of Ages, page 534. Because Christ was one with the Father, equal with him, he could make an atonement for transgression and save man, not in his sins, but from his sins. In the words spoken to God's faithful ones, Come, ye blessed of my Father, Christ says, Inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Then from the host of the redeemed there rises the triumphant chorus, O death, where is thy sting? O grave, where is thy victory? O oh, that our minds could comprehend the greatness of the theme and the wonderful importance of the occasion. Whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. If a man keep my saying, he shall never see death. God's chosen ones may fall at their post of duty, but they have only fallen asleep to rest till Jesus awakes them to share with him an eternal weight of glory. The Upward Look, page 272. For further reading, Our High Calling, Come Unto Me, page 97, and The Desire of Ages, Lazarus, Come Forth, pages 524 to 536.